a few a few comments from the from the crowd. Uh, one person during the during the break asked me pointed out that artists uh, art students always have to take art history classes and wondered how many art historians have to take <laughs> painting classes and what kind of slippage might result. <laughs> and and so th that's an issue. Uh, and uh, another comment uh, uh, about. How? Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll let that person say it themselves in a little while. But so we are now going from uh, from art historians, art curators, rec recovering art curators, uh, to a panel of artists, um, and in part, once again, asking to what extent what we've heard so far makes sense or doesn't make sense uh, from the point of view of a practicing artist. And we're going to do it with April Gornick over here first. Again, the biographies are all in your in your pamphlets, uh, and then it will be Chuck, and then it will be Jerry Davis, and then Vincent Desiderio. April. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to start off by saying that I was um, I didn't quite finish Benjamin's book, but I thought it was really terrific and very stimulating. Oh, is this on? Look, it's on. No. Is this is it me? <laughs> is it me? It couldn't be. I'll just. Okay. Okay, so, um, but I wanted to say that my, I guess, I guess Benjamin really won my heart when he referred to his daughter's apprenticeship and her eventual materializing as an artist being a kind of a b art mitzvah <laughs> for her. <laughs> <laughs> now, does that convince you to read the book? <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to start, I, you know, I was going to show slides on it, I was going to show slides, but I want to just run through a few slides because I have this very um, specific relationship with the view of Delft. Um, when I very first started painting paintings, and this is one from 1980, um, I was just kind of finding my way, painting landscapes, being really scared because I had gone to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, which was a conceptual art school. But then I found myself really wanting to paint landscapes, and I did. And I had, I had spent my most of my summer right after I graduated with a BFA from Nova Scotia in Europe and I went to all the museums that I could find that I that had all this work that I had never seen before in real life and I and I do think that real life trumps all the googling you can possibly do ever forever but um, so I spent all this time looking at all these paintings that I'd always wanted to see in person and I was running through the um, I'll just show slides as I talk I was running through the Moritz Swiss. I was sort of just ticking off museums, basically, at that point. And I was going through the portrait gallery, the way that it was set up then. And I was, I was thinking, ah, eh, portraits, this is so boring. And then I came to this painting. And I just stopped dead. I, I mean, literally, I s was transfixed. And I'd never seen, the, I don't remember seeing this painting in art history class. I probably did and had fallen asleep at that point. And I just thought, well, this is the most strange experience afterwards, because I stared at it for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I was really more interested in um, art made by so-called primitive cultures then, at that point. Long story, but I was kind of more interested in looking at African and oceanic art than major European art historical paintings and uh, works of art. But, and I did, because I wanted to see them anyway. But this was just something that was entirely unexpected. And then I wanted to keep, um, then I went back to Nova Scotia, then I moved to New York, and I started painting after I got back. But I completely forgot about having seen this painting until like years later when I found myself working and something, not this one, actually a previous one, reminded me of that painting. And I thought, oh my god, everything that I've ever done in my paintings has been about that painting. Because when you look at the view of Delft, to me, there's this there's a kind of a sense of a proscenium. Bachelard would have described it as intimacy in immensity. That there's a kind of a, a sense of, of coalescing of, uh, for me, like light as emotion. I'm projecting, but I'm an artist. I can. Um, and so this, the way that the way that the verticals and the horizontal. I mean, this this painting to me weaves an actual place that's so specific, to me it feels like a person. It feels like the actual artist's soul in place language. So, and, and then 
There's also this question for me about the interior and the exterior that exists in this painting that I'm, I'm looking in, I'm, I'm in the outside because I'm looking at a landscape, but there is a series of interiors and exteriors that keep happening and happening as you look at it that to me mirrors being a person in the world in, a, in the most profound and beautiful <coughs> and poetic way. So, and then it, ever since I've been, and so before that and ever since, I've been painting these paintings where I'm trying to connect earth and sky I'm crossing water to get to land events, which are a kind of event. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to locate myself. And I think that the amazing thing about Vermeer is that he locates himself in both landscape, even though there's only a couple of examples, the Little Street being the other supremely beautiful painting, and in portraiture. And for me, I guess, you know, auto location or somehow finding out where I am is, is the big question art. I assume this is the case for most artists unless they're very ideational and I think that they're somehow um, carving out representations of ideas that they have. But this is like coming up to the present. So I'm just showing you like how big a thing this was for me with Vermeer because I think it continues to this very day. So I, owe, I believe that I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. For me, the difference between portrait and landscape is slim. This might sound odd, but I find myself particularly compelled by artists who do p paintings of people who will paint a singular image of a person with which I can have an intimate relationship. And for me, the way I try to paint landscapes is to try to allow a person to project into it so that they actually have an intimate experience with it, a, a very personal, uninterrupted experience that's, in my case, not mediated by other people in the, in the presence of the painting. I'm not interested in people looking at one of my paintings and seeing how big they are in relation to a tree or a boulder or a sky or water or whatever. But when, I've, when I find myself looking at a Vermeer, I also find myself captivated into, and I, I mean into, a kind of a space and a kind of a place that's both um, a kind of a, a person and also a kind of an, an entity that feels to me like an environment. It's like, and, and that of course mirrors the fact of painting. Great paintings are all complete environments in which you exist temporarily. You know, you make this exchange and, and you suddenly become that. That's, that's your, that's the gift that painting is for us, that it allows that kind of extraordinary projection. So, and then um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the pictures that Benjamin showed. When I look at the, the woman in the red hat and the girl at the virginal, I just think, no way are these done by the same painter because for one thing, they're 10 years apart according to, do I have my dates right? Just, okay, in the, what I looked up, the girl with the red hat was 1665, and the virginal was 1674-ish, 73-74. Okay, but I still think it's, it just seems almost impossible that these were done by the same person, because one is so awkward, the virginal girl is just so incredibly awkward, and the red hat is so flowing and I keep I kept wondering when I kept looking at it in your various slides if there might not have been um, just something that Vermeer was trying out with the girl with the red hat that was just kind of a not not to say that Marie couldn't have done it but I'm just wondering also to your point about the the state of empathy in terms of the um, girl with the pearl earring and the painting of Elizabeth I can't help thinking you know, when you were saying, I just want to say this for what it's worth. I kept thinking Vermeer loved both his daughters in the different way that they were. And Maria was much more beautiful, and Elizabeth wasn't. But Elizabeth has this crazy, open hearted face. And maybe it's his painting of her because she, he, he had that kind of empathy for her, and he loved her just the way she was. And if that's the case, then I think it's an extraordinary painting of empathy. And I think that all paintings really work via empathy, via empathy and an empathetic response, and I think that the only way you can really look at a painting is with empathy. And the other thing about the, the painting of Elizabeth is that that bit of um, drapery behind her, I guess you'd say, from her garment that she's wearing, that is such a beautiful line. I mean, I think it's extraordinary. 
And I think it stands somewhat in contrast to her round, simple face. I don't know, it seems like a Vermeer move, like par excellence to me. So that's just my, my feeling about it. Um, and then the girl with the pearl earring and this, you know, I, to your point also about the dark background that usually is behind the, um, the, the double portraits when there's two figures, um, usually with a map or some kind of fabric or something like that. The fact that the girl with the pearl earring, there's, there's a few other portraits where the, the main background aspect is a, a uniform color. So that doesn't seem so different to me. Also, the way that the hands are supposedly more clumsy in the mistress and maid portrait, I, I grant that they could be more beautifully defined. On the other hand, there's something about the way that the light is kind of obliterating everything. It's, I mean, he, really, the light's very keyed up in this painting. And that also seems like something that could be just a, you know, a, a Vermeer experiment that's really well within his, his oeuvre. Um, and then these two paintings similarly seem very, very different from each other. Um, I, uh, the one on the left seems much more accomplished, much more crystalline, much more beautiful. And the, um, the, um, sorry, what's the name of that one? The, the girl interrupted just seems a lot, much, much more awkward, the compositionally and in every other way. So I'm wondering about that. I was also, I'm also wondering if, if Maria started to paint his paintings, what was Vermeer doing while she was painting? Did he just kind of quit? And if so, why? That's just a question that I think, you know, bears some examination. And also, might it not be possible that um, if Maria painted the girl with the red hat, then maybe one of the other siblings painted the girl interrupted? <laughs> because if she painted the girl with the red hat, then she's much, much better than the person <laughs> who painted this one. So, I, you know, anyway, those were the questions that I was left with. And if you, you know, want to talk about it, that's fine. But those were my thoughts. And, and I very much enjoyed this day. So, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, it's too bad Lynn and Auckland isn't here today um, because she'd be uh, forced to update her book, Why Were There No Great Women Painters, and write, Why Was There Only One Great Woman Painter? And why did she quit painting as a teenager? It's, um, it's pretty, it's a conundrum. It's like uh, pretty hard to accept for me. I think the way I, I'm, I enjoyed very much what the previous panels had to say, but they see things very differently. Um, an artist, painting is the most magical of mediums. It makes space where there is no space. It transports you to places you have been or have never been. Uh, it um, transcends. It's physical reality of colored dirt smeared on a piece of canvas, wrapped around some stretchers. Um, and those of us who have pushed paint around, let's face it, we just look at art very differently from people who haven't had that experience. For me, the greatest art historians are those art historians who also had been a painters and understand uh, what, the, what the process is like. Um, won't name names or point out people who didn't do that, but um, that that magic is something that you either get or you don't get based on your based on your experience. So um, when when we look at um, at these works, and I, I came up with my own list of the masterpieces. One of the great things about being an artist is I don't have to defend them. I, you know, I don't have to be fair. It's not art appreciation. It's either useful to me or it's not. So it's useful, it's great. If it isn't, it's not. And uh, I feel sorry for those um, art historians here who uh, have to defend every goddamn thing they ever say. 
um, to a set of people who are uh, non-believers or difficult to convert. So I, I noticed some things about the paintings which I consider the masterpieces. Um, the Procurus from 1656, and not just because he's got a hand in a breast, although it helps. Uh, the maid servant pouring milk, and how definitively better that painting is than the other woman pouring a pitcher, which is a real clunker. A uh, soldier and a laughing uh, girl. Now these go 56, 57, 58. And then the next, for me, the next great painting is The Little Street from 1664. I remember the Vermeer and his, um, and his, what was it called? Vermeer and his group or whatever at the Met. And the, the Little Street hung next to De Hoek's similar brick building. And here you have an incredible example of magic and clunkiness. clunkiness. De Hoek painted every brick. He went around every brick. He painted every piece of mortar. He, he did a, you can count, you can count every brick and know exactly what the building had um, uh, had in it. On the other hand, Vermeer did not paint bricks at all. He painted the situation of brickness. The situation of brickness with light falling on it. And the two paintings across the way in the Met, the De Hoek was just paint, and the Vermeer was if it were lit from within, like, um, tell me who? Jeff Wall. Jeff Wall. And that's because he was not painting the stuff. Why wasn't he painting the stuff? And this is the issue for the day for me. He didn't paint stuff because he was painting light while looking at a camera obscura. The first one of these things that I was at, even before the NYU one, with, um, with uh, my mind is to say, um, David Hockney, was in uh, the National Gallery. And it was the most an annoying couple days of my life, <laughs> was art historians and scientists. And they couldn't, the art historians could not agree that Vermeer or virtually anyone else used the camera obscura. In frustration, I scream at them at some point. You guys are like the OJ jury. They said, if he painted, <laughs> if, you pay, if he painted from a camera, why isn't there, why isn't there written evidence that he did? Well, the reason there isn't written uh, evidence is the family secret was to hide the use of a lens. That was essential. And it really doesn't matter who did what. Nothing would make me happier than to find a woman uh, painted these incredible paintings. Nothing would make me happier. I just don't buy it. Not that she couldn't as a woman or as a girl. I just don't buy it. So um, when, um, when you look at something like uh, the view of Delft, anybody who's put their head into a large format view camera and stared at a ground glass screen knows what happens to light when it comes through the lens. It, each little dot of light takes on the aperture of the lens. Now with lenses that have shutters, those, those apertures are like this. But lenses like these didn't have shutters, so it's round. If you look at the view of Delft, every goddamn thing they're painting is reflecting light and everything is a big spot of light. I wish I could get it up there. Um, and I find it, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, find, I find it annoying, but, uh, and it flattens the painting out and makes it pattern for me. But clearly he used the camera obscure for that. And um, uh, I remember at that panel, one of the art historians said, well, we know what Vermeer painted like because we have the artist in his atelier. 
I went, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> How? Yeah, great. Look, uh, when you see it blown up, it's just hundreds of thousands of spots. The rivets on the boat, the da 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 da, da. So, and the, uh, um, he really thought. The artist, the actual gaze behind Oh, great. Oh, that's the other side. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had a Ford ride to Vienna, and I saw this painting every day for a year and a half. And it's clearly made with a camera obscura. Nothing else would do that. The little pinholes of light through the tapestry have that telltale quality. And so this art historian, who was a big deal art historian, he said, we know what, how he painted, because there he is painting a, a portrait, a painting of painting. <laughs> and I said, that's not a Vermeer pose. He would never paint somebody in that pose. All he needs is somebody wearing the coat and the hat, painting with a mall stick, freehand, which he didn't do. And we think that that's Vermeer. Um, then we go on to um, the astronomer and the geographer. Can't possibly be Vermeer. Cannot possibly be Vermeer. Clearly painted with a camera obscura. He can't paint himself while looking through a camera obscura. I'm really sorry. I'd love to buy it. But it can't be done. Um, so family members being painted preserve the family secret. And that family secret was essential for him painting them all by himself or even having other people painting them as well. But the main secret, in my opinion, is uh, that of uh, the use of the lens. So now fast forward. In 1960, whatever it was when I got to New York, I was painting from photographs. I didn't even paint from slides. I painted from photographs. Uh, Philip Perlstein, my good friend, wrote a full page article in the Times at Hilton Kramer's bequest, behest, saying, I get my highs from using my eyes. And I said, what am I doing? Just because I'm looking at a photograph, I'm not using my eyes? What's the difference between looking at a figure and looking at a photograph? They both take work and perception and decision on how you're going to distill that information. And, uh, but there was this sense that it was cheating. I went to the Figurative Art Alliance. Did you ever do that? Oh, what a hoot. Uh, Figurative Art Alliance out in Brooklyn. Did you? No, uh, no, no, no. It was a group of um, right wing. Uh, eyeball, eyeball, well, I thought you might have gone there just as a visitor. No, no. No. Uh, eyeball, what they call themselves eyeball realists, to distinguish themselves from photorealists or whatever. Uh, so I, you know, I thought, well, you know, it'll be interesting. So I went, and I swear to you, they threw cans of beer at me. They spit on me because I worked from photographs. and. They thought they were closer to God because they worked from life. I mean, come on. And that was in the uh, early 70s. So uh, it's not um, something that, and it's still with us. I did a third grade class in my studio, and I'd made the painting of Mark Greenwald with, with the kind of goofy one at the Met with the teeth and stuff, which I, I happen to think is a pretty accomplished painting. I put a lot. 14 months work to do it, and my heart and soul, he's my best friend, I want to do a good job. So I have the painting, I'm working on it. There's the painting and the dye transfers and all that stuff. So this little boy raises his hand and he says, can you really draw or do you just copy photographs? <laughs> and I thought, here, it starts already from the mouth of babes. There's a prejudice as if it's uh, as if it's cheating. Uh, like, I don't think artists really care about cheating, to tell you the truth. Um, and I don't care what tools are used and what ones aren't. But that notion that without, uh, without uh, eyewitnesses, did I finish the OJ thing? I probably didn't. Did I tell why? Okay. 
I'm losing my uh, memory these days. I said, without eyewitnesses, you won't accept the fact that this is made by Vermeer. You like the OJ jury. I probably went a little further, and I said, like, Holocaust deniers and people who deny the uh, uh, um, global warming. But um, my job is to, like, uh, prod. So um, I said, you're like the OJ jury. You won't convict without an eyewitness, no matter how many bloody Bruno Molly footprints there are. And we don't, artists don't need eyewitnesses. Artists love the bloody Bruno Molly footprints because it's proof that something happened. And you just follow the proof that something happened and you come, uh, you come to a conclusion. And I think that's um, um, essentially the most important thing for me in all of this is not whether or not you're right, you're wrong, I, I, I don't know what percentage of your theses I buy, but the main one, the main one that just sticks in my craw is how do you possibly explain uh, Vermeer's use of the camera and making a self-portrait of him as a geographer and a self-portrait of him as an uh, uh, astronomer and a self-portrait as the artist, nor his, if we accept your and I'd love to, I'd really love to accept the fact that his daughter made, uh, I don't care, she can do the, the girl of Pearl Earring, it's not that good. But the, um, the woman with the red hat is transcendent. Transcendent, and perhaps, I hate to say this, in only a way that an artist will ever understand. When you look at it, I know how every painting in the history of the world was ever made except Vermeer's. Vermeer's paintings are like they blew onto the canvas with a divine breath of air. It's so magical that only another magician can even begin to understand, and I can only barely begin to understand myself. And I collect Dutch and Flemish old masters. Uh, you know, this is my, this is my world now. Uh, contemporary artists watch too expensive, have you noticed? <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, <laughs> that painting, The Girl in the Red Hat, is my absolute favorite Vermeer. And um, the, the other one is The Maid Servant Pouring Milk, which I saw about a million times in, in Amsterdam. The difference between the one woman pouring um, uh, something for a pitcher and The Maid Servant is light years. It's inconceivable to me that he made one of them and then turned around and made the other one. What was the difference in age? Uh, help me. I see right Yeah. Unusual. Okay. Um, well, you know, he had a really good month and then he didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's, the, for me, what keeps me from accepting so many other things uh, that I really like that you had to say and that I would embrace with great passion because, I, first of all, we don't let lead Lennon Auckland, who doesn't even bother to show up, I might point out, to let us know what um, is uh, the work of a great woman artist. If she is, She's the greatest woman artist of all time. Oh, oh yeah. I love the one with the, the, the flute player, which I always call the woman of the Chinese hat. I, I, and I don't care that it's a claw. Um, it is. It is a claw. Um, uh, look at those. Look at those. Come on. They, Painted right one right after another, and look at the use of the camera obscura in the maid servant pouring milk. First of all, there are multiple foci. Is that the word? The little seeds on the bread. I'm glad that he paid his bread bill, or we would we wouldn't have this painting. 
But the, the light glistening off the sesame seeds and stuff. And then she, it's in focus, she's in focus. And clear back on the wall, the basket is in perfect focus. So he's had to adjust this lens. Now we know he would only have been able to afford one lens. He knew the astronomer, and he had one lens. And he, we can tell by looking at the lion's head on the chairs what the focal length of the lens is. And we know the viewing, we know how far he was away. Um, so here's just a really interesting aside. A guy who painted complete reality, right? Look at the space between her arm and the picture. Okay? Uh, her right arm of the picture. Look at the color of the wall between her right arm of the picture and the wall behind it. It is impossible. If you take a reproduction and you color that space in the same color as the wall behind it, the arm flies back and he drops the picture. So even somebody who had reality to look at, a lens and incredible skill, and wanted to paint, we assume, reality, Sometimes you have to go in there and figure out a way to make it work. That's what artists do. All right, I, I beat it to death. That's what artists do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think that um, I think that we're cheating in uh, in fact right now. <laughs> And maybe kind of uh, taunting you, Benjamin, because we're going to get away with all of our conjectures and we can sort of say whatever we want. Um, so I'm going to be uh, really divergent from um, all of the historians and totally um, run with the, our innate ability to um, sort of deduce entire worlds from the subtleties of looking at human faces. Um, I'm sort of the representative self-portrait artist here. Um, that's kind of what I do. So I started looking at um, that aspect of the book and really just started digging into whether or not it's possible to tell what is a self-portrait and what is not a self-portrait from glancing at it. Um, what happens, this is uh, my sort of assertion, um, when our gaze meets itself is different than what happens when our gaze meets a stranger. I think that um, I think that you'll you know, come to your own conclusions, but I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, for starters, oh, there it went. OK, this is um, Parmigianino. Um, and uh, probably one of the earliest examples of an artist getting his hands on a mirror uh, at the point when mirrors were all curved. He's kind of not the most observant painter in the world, but you still get this sense of him kind of there's a kind of a, like a vacuum in his eyes versus this, which is a painting that he did of a gentleman, patron, sitter, who's got this kind of affect that he's wearing. He literally looks like he's making a face. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is Van Eyck, um, who seems more like he's looking through us than at us. Um, and uh, you can compare that with his portrait of a woman who looks like she's either bored and thinking about what she's going to do when she gets home, or maybe she's blowing bubbles with her mouth. I don't know what she's doing, but she's not like she's not connected to the viewer. Um, this guy's pretty attentive. Uh, he's sitting still long enough. This is kind of a uh, hard to see reproduction, but he's drawn in. This is Albrecht Durer self-portrait. Um, He's drawn in every strand of his own hair and his beard and uh, is clearly sitting here you know, with his fur jacket for hours on end versus this woman who I'm sure could not hold this pose for very long. But I mean, just to get the sense of her kind of um, projecting a certain look through her face versus here where the face is blank and the eyes are the only active element. Um, and these, by the way, are, um, are particular to self-portraits done with mirrors. I don't uh, have anything at all against photography. In fact, I used to battle with one of my professors who would pound his fist on the desk and say, photography is not an art. Um, and I, I think he's wrong, but I do think there's also a difference. And I think when you're looking into a mirror, there's something that happens to your face that's different than when you look into a, a camera where you're still 
for that split second able to kind of like project what you think you will look like. Um, that's the Durer again. Um, this one we know, Rembrandt. Um, Jerry, talk more into those microphones. Ah, okay. Move the mic a little around so it's on the other side. So um, I was, you know, when I first started, when I first started to put this together, I was trying to, um, I was trying to look at things like whether or not Maria Vermeer had, you know, one eye that connected more than another, which Rembrandt does. His left eye in this portrait um, connects directly to you, and the right eye kind of shoots off, which is something that was pointed out by uh, Trevor and Ryan, who are here. Um, but Maria Vermeer's eyes don't diverge, either in the portraits that uh, her father would have done of her or in her own self-portraits. So um, this you know, kind of hypothesis that I'm, that I'm giving you guys started out as trying to find like very minute, detailed um, explanations for what might make something a self-portrait or not, and uh, turned into a little bit more of a kind of um, feeling, feeling based thing. Anyway, so Rembrandt painting himself, Rembrandt painting another woman. Um, all right. Um, Frida Kahlo. Um, even where she's incredibly tense, there's all this tension in her face, tension in her neck. Her eyes are still sucking all of the attention in this image versus her portrait of Diego Rivera, where you kind of bounce off the surface. Um, this is a very dark reproduction of a self-portrait that I made um, looking through a window at night, where even though you can see the eye on the right and the eye on the left are not actually even directly looking at you, but this still has that kind of vortex, the eye vortex, um, that you feel, you almost feel like you're being looked through rather than being looked at by the subject. Um, and uh, another quality of selves that I find is that they're ugly. Um, this is a detail of this painting. It's a self-portrait that I did in a Mylar balloon. Um, not the prettiest portrait as opposed to this, which is a portrait done by another artist seeing me from the outside. Um, and um, I think this is because when you paint, you have to learn to turn the idea of what you're seeing on and off. It's the same as that um, Ren's book, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees. You have to see what is actually there as opposed to what you expect to be there in order to be able to um, you know, ha go anywhere new. So um, um, yeah, this is a another self-portrait. Um, this is a portrait of friend. Again, kind of wearing her face. Um, so having gone through all of those slides, I would sort of put these back on the board as a question. Which one does that look like? Um, and then this is, for, uh, this is for you, Chuck. This is me at age 15. Um, and that's a painting I'm working on on the left, and my parents were not painters, and I grew up in Alabama. Oh. <laughs> um, wow. So. <laughs> my condolences. Me to show you this portrait. In that context of what you're saying about what would you say, making it ugly or making it looking through it or something? Um, it's a portrait laying on the floor with a mirror suspended overhead. Hmm. And, and how would you describe it in terms of how it would be different if you were portraying someone else? Well, I think that the face falls away and you and the eyes become like over, like hyperactive. And what do you make of the red hat? Of the red, red hat? I, um, my feeling is that. Uh, okay, what about um, I, I agree with Benjamin on a lot of points. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. 
And I, I mean, there are other issues too, you know, like the changing of the direction of the light. If you're, you're working from a camera obscura, then you know, the light gets reversed versus if you're working in a mirror. So I think she's probably working actually from a mirror because although uh, Benjamin disagrees with me on this, I, I don't think that you can make a self-portrait in a camera obscura. So there are other things like that that would indicate the same thing. What do you think the difference between uh, working with a mirror? I mean, artists are in that period also used mirrors to make projections. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the Arnold Feeney wedding, there's a mirror, con convex mirror. And if you were to uh, silver the other side, you actually can use it to project an image, and uh, Hockney did that in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and it was startling. The image was so sharp and so clear and so bright, you could sit in there and paint all day long. Um, but it is different, a mirror. Uh, but I don't think, I don't, I don't, the thing is, you can paint, in order, the way that a the way that a camera obscura works is that you have a really brightly lit, which is actually why supposedly Caravaggio started using, Chiar like, that's kind of where chiaroscuro mm -hmm. came from. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to really bright, brightly light your subject. Your subject has to be standing in front of a, basically a pinhole, a small, small opening or like a little doorway, some, something small, so that the interior of the box is darkly enough lit that when the image is projected dimly, actually, you can still see it. I remember the um, first time I ever, I, uh, when, when so, long before Soho was even Soho, I went over to West Broadway to visit a friend, and those were the days when there were no intercoms, so you'd yell up, and then they'd drop a key down on a little hanky parachute. And I, I uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, so I opened the door, and I went in, and they probably hadn't paid the con ed, though there was no light going on whatsoever inside the, 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 the hallway, and they're waiting for the, uh, the person to go down the elevator. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I realized that I saw a yellow school bus go by upside down. I'm not the first person to ever notice that light coming through a keyhole makes these images. And now there are a lot of artists who actually make art that way. There's even an artist who makes art through pinhole washing machines, you know, he processes the whole thing in the washing machine. But um, it is. Um, um, it must have been dumb, dumbfounding, but it didn't require any technology at all. Just natural daylight outside and an aperture in the right distance to the wall. It must have just blown people's minds. Um, is, there a lo is there a lot of written stuff about people stumbling on, on this and wondering how they could use it? There's a very famous text by Constantine Houghton Mm -hmm. We certainly, uh, and but this was Hockney the conference presumably was talked a lot about that there is uh, plenty of evidence there. There's mm -hmm. you know we don't have a we don't have a document that says Vermeer used the camera obscura, but we certainly don't have any reason to doubt it. I mean, they, uh, we would have to not take the subway, but take the twelve year uh, uh, time machine to go back and have this conversation. But anyway, uh, Vince, why don't we start with you? I think that I saw a, um, I saw um, an engraving, and I don't know how accurate, uh, I don't know how accurate it was, but an engraving that showed Al Hazan uh, demonstrating a peephole, um, and that that would be like 800 uh, A.D., uh, and a lot of Al Hazan's uh, uh, ideas about optics entered into Italy and were certainly influential mm -hmm. in Alberti and Brunelleschi's. Uh, thinking, you know, so the influence of that Arabic tradition of optics and long. Oh, so you did it, huh? Already you told me to shut up. All right, okay. They also used the grid in Egypt 15,000 years ago. Yeah. We have to lobby for our own devices. Huh? 
Uh, there's actually a, uh, I don't know if you've got here, but yeah, it's pretty pertinent though. Um, it's pertinent, though. There, um, there was a, um, I think it's in John, uh, John Barth's book on the uh, replenishment of literature. Uh, at the end of it, he describes the, uh, the, uh, what's written on a, an ancient Egyptian tablet by a scribe. And the scribe is bemoaning on the tablet that everything that can possibly be written has already been written. Uh, so, you know, we repeat things over and over again in history. And I think some of the things that were mentioned were really uh, marvelous, especially in regard to um, the difference between, uh, certainly the difference between art artistic thought and, uh, and uh, practice, and the difference, and uh, critical thought and historical thought. There doesn't, uh, I don't think anyone's in doubt about any of that. Uh, they're completely different disciplines. I might say that uh, one of the diff key differences is that uh, in many ways, art takes place in, in a present tense and tries to, great masterpieces try to evoke a present tense of being. Whereas so much of historical thinking and critical thinking uh, is a fait accompli in a certain sense. It's about things that have happened. Uh, it describes things that have already been made. And th this is a, a very uh, curious distinction because it um, points to how we educate young artists in regard to um, their performance as, uh, as, as artists as they go on. One of the most difficult things to describe to students is that um, artists use a kind of compression device inside of themselves to uh, acquire information and sensation and subject it to a deep compression inside of themselves until the idea, the visual idea, effervesces from this compression. And since it's chain, it, it changes substance pretty much between a kind of determinate uh, 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 body of information and sensation into something that is, uh, that is very indeterminate, difficult to describe, and difficult to disentangle in regard to what is actually at work within the, uh, within the artist's mind. And therefore, we focus on the material aspect of pictures uh, in order to um, make claims about them. Of course, it's, it's clear that um, from an earlier point in, uh, in critical history, the, the intention of the artist has been written out of the discussion because it's purely speculative. And it's not subject to the theoretical uh, thinking that would be required for a scientificated discipline like uh, literary theory or critical theory. So there's a key difference between the way artists think and the way um, historians think, although both involve tremendous creative potential. And uh, the works of historians and critics is uh, amazing to me, stimulating. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I've written some things out because I wanted to make sure I said them the way I wanted to say them and to be brief. Um, I think both, um, I'm really grateful to be here, first of all. I think a lot of the wonderful things have been said. And I, Ren, you're amazing in putting together these symposiums. Amazing. Um, I think uh, in both his introduction and at various points in the book, uh, ben indicates that the idea of family secrets does not merely pertain to speculations regarding the attribution of certain paintings to Vermeer, uh, of Vermeer to his daughter Maria, but to what he refers to as the strategies passed down among artists from one generation to another. And although this may sound suspiciously close to the subject of another symposium held here a few years ago regarding the secret knowledge of painters, uh, I'm struck with the, uh, by the directness with which uh, Professor Binstock incorporates insights gleaned from the close observation and appreciation of painting. It may very well be that uh, insights such as his will find little support among the vast majority of scholars whose rightful place it is to require solid textual verification, or among critical theorists whose refined semiological structures keep the elusive emotive issues of painting at bay. It seems to me that Professor Binnestock is proposing a new branch of connoisseurship, one that is well-informed and appreciative of the more orthodox systems of our historical investigation. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> As such, he's located himself in a position incommensurable with the normal structures of critical work, 
Um, if this is so, it may well be in keeping with Paul Feyerabend's belief regarding the growth of knowledge that the uh, uh, principles uh, of uh, si the, the simultaneous principle uh, existence of principles of proliferation and tenacity at any given time are absolutely vital to the evolution of thought. I think that these kinds of things have been mentioned uh, already. Uh, in other words, ideas formerly at odds with one another can converge at a future date. Vermeer is an ideal candidate for all of this. Um, lost to history soon after his death, his rediscovery centuries later coincided with the genesis of photography. So you can see how there's sort of a kind of uh, spl uh, splaying away from the mainstream and then a convergence um, in, at a later date. Although he was certainly not the only Dutch painter of his time to, um, to um, use the camera obscura, I mean, it was well documented that these people were using it. And you can see in De Hoek and in certainly Carl Fabricius and many other painters that the camera obscura is at work. To my mind, he was the only one, the only one of these Dutch painters of his time to consistently allow for the mediation distortions of uh, light and focus to play a major role in the meanings of his pictures. Moreover, given the uh, dearth of solid information pertaining to his life and work, although there must be more than I imagine, um, uh, and owing to the profoundly poetic restraint unique to him, it's no wonder that he remains the Sphinx of Delft. Um, there's a remarkable poetry in Vermeer that um, sometimes what makes us want to see these things as um, pictures of intimate family relationships. And I think that they are. But I think that there's something else at work in Vermeer. And I think to get to the bottom of it, it may be um, of use to future connoisseurship or history of histories of painting to um, Try to get inside the minds of how painters really think when they're working on art. Though this may not, this certainly is not verifiable, and uh, painters generally tend to verify the works of previous painters by um, almost allegorizing the methods of previous painters and keeping them alive in a, in, for a new generation. Therefore, if the idea has substance to it and it sort of provokes discussion over centuries from one generation to the next, then it, it's, it sustains its existence. Therefore, it has a certain degree of verifiability um, in that regard. Um, when, when, when I think about painting, I think of different, different forms of the way painters go about understanding uh, their relationship to history. Uh, one way is through emulation. You can see here Delacroix and Rubens. Um, another way I call uh, emblemization, which, uh, by which artists um, almost create a, a very compact sign uh, of condensed information taken from one generation to the next. Here, uh, Manet's famous Pfeiffer, done in a direct response to Velazquez's actor. In, 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 Velas in Manet's case, the idea that he's removing things from the, um, the um, responsibility of a kind of optical illusion and presenting, say, brush marks, brush marks for just themselves is a way of emblemizing or sort of uh, decontextualizing from one area of context to another. Uh, certainly Duchamp does that when he takes, machine, you know, takes objects out of their use. Uh, when these things are taken out of their use, uh, they actually reveal themselves, as Heidegger would say. And so we begin to see them and look at them differently. I think in Manet's case, he was pointing to the idea that, um, that there are things at work in the painter's mind that are not evident because they are disguised often by the, the uh, patinas of illusion in a picture or of nar uh, narratives that are dramatic. The technical narrative of a picture is generally the most important narrative of the picture. When we go to the Metropolitan Museum, and on one wall there are Turbox, and on the other wall there are Vermeers, um, we first notice on the surface that there are little Dutch people in little Dutch rooms doing little Dutch things. <laughs> okay? Then we look at the Vermeers and we compare them to the Turbox and we see a world of difference. We don't look at the Turbox, the, the Vermeers, to really understand so much what that letter is that, that is being passed. 
Uh, well, there are so many other paintings of people passing letters that could tell us the same information. We look at Vermeer's deeply because there's something in his technique that tells it a story that could very well be at odds with the dramatic narrative of the piece. These things happen in painting all the time. Uh, but getting to the bottom of them is tricky business because how can you verify it, A, except through making paintings yourself? Anyway. Um, Another um, way of looking at things is what I call the alleg allegorization of method. And here, um, um, you know, we see clearly the mother well, and there are certainly aspects of other paintings that I feel are definitely related to, to mother well's thinking, um, but how can I prove it? I can't. But the issue that um, I wanted to describe mostly re uh, reg regards, and we think about those tour box in relation to Vermeer, there's a very big difference. And in many, many Dutch paintings of the time that, that derive from either a mannerist notion of, spa of, of space and form or the, the influence of the Caravaggisti, we see an emphasis on the actual presentation of form. Whereas in Vermeer, we see an emphasis on the presentation of figures almost liquefied in space. Now, you have to bear with me just a bit here. When we talk about Caravaggio and the Caravaggisti, which were definitely known to Vermeer, we, I tend to think of it, let me say it this way, I tend to think of it in regard to the evolution of perspective the evolution of perspective um, in Western art. Uh, and um, curiously enough, you know, it begins with a peephole and a mirror. Brunelleschi's demonstration was that he looked through, he painted the, demonstra painted the baptistry of San Giovanni on a panel, drilled a hole through the back at the vanishing point, and then encouraged people to view the painting with a mirror at arm's length, looking through the back of the panel at the reflected image. Now, the question always, you know, it's a kind of, a, it's a very curious demonstration. Certainly he's fixing the vanishing point at the point, uh, you know, the eye at the point of that vanishing point. But what he's doing moreover, which I think is more important to the evolution of perspective for painters, is that he is, he is allowing the viewer to see the eye projected back at them at the infinite point of convergence or as uh, Alberti would call it, quasi ad infinita, because you can't arrive at infinity. For me, this is a neoplatonic machine. Ay, caramba. <laughs> For me, perspective then, and born at a time when clearly neoplatonism was, was get, gaining a strong foothold in Italy, Nicholas of Cusa was a friend of uh, Alberti's. Uh, his doctor was uh, Stefano Toscanelli, who was the physician and taught mathematics to Piero della Francesca. This was a group of Neoplatonists who were simultaneously describing the universe as infinite and trying to create a machine that could capture the uh, identity of the locus of man within this sort of infinity. So um, this is important. Uh, this is really important for Vermeer, believe me, because Vermeer is well aware of a tradition that comes from the Caravaggisti. Now, what is the relationship between linear perspective and, and the a chiaroscuro of a figure? I think that the, the figures in Caravaggio's paintings foreground the, the uh, description of form. And in order to do that, he came up with a very rigorous system of illumination. At the apex of this system is a flashback in the surface of the, uh, of the uh, light mass. That flashback, which is called a highlight, is an incidence of reflection. This is the reflection that is definitely coming from the light source and flashing back to the eye. Now, at the time, I think it was Huggins who just decided that light was not traveling at an infinite rate of speed. But even Descartes believed that light was traveling at an infinite rate of speed. Therefore, the flashback that's uh, uh, bouncing off of the surface of form, placed perfectly, is a kind of corridor, a neoplatonic corridor, corridor, just like the one in linear perspective that connects the eye with the point of infinity. Neoplatonism is predicated upon the flight of the soul. The soul from here to this ineffable one. 
in Ficino, he says that these eminences that arrive on Earth are corrupted. Yes, like Plato says. But through looking at them and observing their beauty, our, in our hearts is inspired a kind of love which brings us back to the divine love. So this circuit is created, the circuitous spiritualis that links man with God. When, pers when the painters invented, pers when the architect invented perspective and painters were using it, began using it, they knew that they had done something that could elevate their status, both intellectually and socially, in the world. And from the moment of perspective's birth, we see a meteoric rise of painters in terms of their acceptance in noble houses and their, uh, their uh, want wannabe status as intellectuals. Incidentally, the uh, emblem of Alberti is an, is an enucleated eye with wings that is flying out. Uh, also, Leonardo's famous comment that the eye is the window of the soul. For painters, this was really important because for the Neoplatonists, the soul divided into two parts had an upper part which was reason, a lower part which was sensation. The only part of the soul that could make this flight was the upper part, the part of reason. Alberti talks about a sensate wisdom in his treatise on perspective. It's about, he does so so that he can reinforce the fact that the sensual um, observations or the sensual information that's brought into the, through the painter's eye is every bit as important and every bit as wise as the information produced by mathematicians and reason. Okay? Um, okay. Um, when Rembrandt painted The Night Watch, it was very clear that he was making a kind of uh, homage to the uh, School of Athens. Rembrandt actually had a number of folios that contained the uh, contained you know images, engravings after Raphael. And of course, I, I imagine Raphael's most famous painting, his greatest masterpiece in certain ways, would have been included in that. When at the center of this, uh, uh, the Raphael, of course. There is uh, you know, Plato's Leonardo and Aristotle, Plato pointing up to the forms and Aristotle pointing out to a, an empirical sort of understanding. In Rembrandt's painting, he has the two characters in the beginning, in the front of it. Uh, the man here is holding a glove, and the glove, an empty glove, is pointing upwards. And the man here has a lance, which is pointing outwards. And moreover, Rembrandt has cast the shadow of one man to indicate the outward thrust of the, of the spear, but also, strangely enough, on the man's crotch. Um, but this is Rembrandt taking on linear perspective through the Baroque optics of illumination. And this is really important. In Baroque painting, if you, this is a description of the form, you can, if you pixelize it, you can come up with places where the light mass is absolutely clearly uh, uh, um, uh, defined by a kind of incidence of reflection in it, okay? Even in, the, even in Vermeer's early work, uh, one could do that to it. So when we talk about dark backgrounds in Vermeer and also light backgrounds as well, you're looking at a man who's doing something very radical. He's actually taking the, the, the two elements of perspective, the linear perspective and the optics of illumination, and combining them in one machine, the camera obscura, which is also a very, very perfect perspective machine. At the same time, it's predicated upon the presence of light in order to function. Um, engraving uh, em from emblem books in the time. And there's actually one really remarkable one that I didn't print out was uh, of, I think it's the Christ child holding his hand to his eye, and there's a hole in his hand, obviously from the, you know, the nail, but he's the child, and he's looking at someone being very foolish. And the caption underneath it is that, you know, of course our, f our foolishness is seen by God. The idea that God is looking through his hand at you doing foolish things, and that Dutch painters used over and again the camera obscura to show people in situations of folly, low life paintings, and uh, taverns, and things like that, um, I don't think is coincidental. 
Also, the capture of light in regard to the Neoplatonic idea, uh, the eminences from above coming down to earth and inspiring music and love. So love becomes a, an important theme in the paintings of Vermeer. Um, at the uh, apex of all of this Neoplatonic system is love. The point in infinity brings our eye to the point of ultimate convergence where we can see the, the origin of love. And the flashback from the Baroque form also indicates a corridor to infinity, which is man's access to, to love. A symbol of love in the Renaissance, of course, was the Venus uh, in her dual permutations as the celestial and the terrestrial. In Vermeer, his sleeping maid to me is actually a hidden version. Now, why does he hide it? This is the interesting thing. He's hiding it within the pragmatism and the simplicity of, of the Dutch household, and yet, because of his ambition as a painter, and he was truly ambitious as a painter, he wants to tap into the great, the great themes of painting. And at the center of that is the central myth, which is of perspective. The painting at the top actually included a dog which was painted out, and in the background is a mirror. The little dog is an attribute of Venus, the mirror clearly an attribute of Venus. I think you can see the little dog here. Another attribute of, of Venus are pearls. And we see pearls repeatedly in Vermeer's paintings of women. Of course, mirrors also feature in Vermeer's paintings as well. The mirror is very important in the context of Venus and in regard to Neoplatonism and the authority of the artist to become the steward of this circuit of, of uh, this circuit of spiritualis, this circuit of relationship between man on earth and God and back. In all of these Venus pictures, Titian, Rubens, and Velazquez, the mirror is positioned such that Vermeer, uh, the, the Venus is not looking at herself. The mirror is tipped so that she's looking at us or looking at the artist. In every one of them, if we see her in the mirror, she can't see herself. So we're watching, looking at a mirror that she has tipped so she can see us to complete a cycle, a triangulation from artist to reflection to divine love, or to love, a symbol of love. In Vermeer's image, one of the few images, maybe the only one where a reflection of the woman actually occurs, is this one, where she, early one, where she's reading a letter and her reflection is in the window, but she is not looking at us. She's looking down at the letter. Now, what is this all about? I think it has to do with the mediating factor of the lens. That the direct line between man or a person on earth and this divine through the perception of nature is now mediated by a kind of lens. So that, you know, now, in order to get back to the, the celestial Venus, Vermeer portrays himself as an astronomer, for the terrestrial Venus, a geographer. So the mediating aspect of the lens takes you one step removed from the actual experience of the thing. And therefore, the only way uh, there is a correspondence anymore with the loved one or the object of love is through uh, literal correspondence, letter writings to and from. Therefore, we see a lot of past letters between someone and received by generally a woman. Um, the uh, problem of the lens and its sort of uh, relationship to experience <laughs> uh, is foregrounded in uh, Stanley Kubrick's Neoplatonic Masterpiece 2001. Um, and sometimes even the camera has trouble <laughs> with things. Okay, so I'm going to make this really brief. I'm going to do this really fast. So Vermeer is celebrating himself as a painter. This is the only pl time where you see him actually in the room with his source of his love, his Venus. Okay, 
Now, another painter who's also in dealing with this circuit is, is uh, Velazquez, who uh, Benjamin devotes a few pages to Las Meninas and all the different theories that surround the interpretation of this great mystery painting. But in terms of careful looking at things, it's always been problematic to me that even though they've discovered, the, uh, or feel the Jonathan Brown claims to also, that uh, the, this room in the Alcazar which was destroyed in the 19th, 18th century, was the room where Velazquez painted Las Meninas. Um, and this is a close-up of that room in a floor plan that exists from the date. Even Martin Kemp actually describes, uh, I think the lower illustration is from his book. The thing that's always been curious to me about this is that the stairway that the man is walking through in the back, the Chamberlain, Lord Chamberlain in the background, is not on that side of the room, but on this side of the room. And um, so that in and of itself presents a real problem in terms of how we read this room. Um, it's my conviction that Vermeer painted this picture in a mirror. And that's why the room is reversed. Uh, yes, Vermeer painted it first and then Velasquez. <laughs> Velasquez painted it. So the, the room actually had this appearance to it. Two minutes, okay. So Velasquez, you know, blah, blah, blah. If, uh, when I was at Dartmouth, I positioned a mirror, using mirrors and, uh, and lenses, I positioned a mirror, not only where the king and the queen are, but at the vanishing point, okay? This has to do with Vermeer. Uh, the vanishing point, the doorway where the guy's walking out, whose name, incidentally, was Velasquez as well, though no relation to Velasquez. And uh, this shows the configurations of the mirrors parallel to the canvas, parallel to the presumed mirror here, and a beam of light in the background and the dog. Um, what I saw remarkably was that my reflection was in all three mirrors. And then I went up to the uh, architectural department, I'm almost, fi almost finished, Fred. I went up to the architectural department and had them construct a virtual model of this room. And they were able to stick virtual mirrors into it. And uh, that's what we saw. Vermeer represented not only in the vanishing point, but in the place where the king and the queen are, and there. Oddly enough, that's the schema of the mirrors. And there you have it. So what does all that show? Is that there is something going on in the minds of the artists that have to do with the preservation of what was their intellectual calling card, ultimately, which was the invention of perspective. It got permutated in a number of different ways over time. But its persistence as the central myth of, of, of artists has endured. Uh, and I think that in much of Vermeer's work, some of that mystery that we see is that he is trying to get at the large idea of the value of the artist through genre painting. And that's all I have to say. Very good. <laughs> I, w I was going to suggest we have a conversation, but we are now really running late. So uh, what I would instead suggest is we take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back. And Can I say one thing? OK, say one thing. <laughs> I think that the machine, or I guess you could say technology, that truly captures the locus of man in infinity the best is painting. I mean, painting, you can have all the devices that you want. I, I actually thought it was fascinating, everything that you said. but I. When you said that one sentence, I thought, well, that's a perfect way of describing painting. No, I don't think that the machine captures the infinity. I think that the machine is a mediator between I know what you're saying. Painting. I'm just saying that But the, when Vermeer paints the picture here, But even artists no who machine. use, you know, 14th, 15th, 16th century technology to make paintings these days, it's more still to me amazing than whatever technological advice we can device we can come up with. Oh, yes, to, I agree. Painting is, is much yeah. more immediate. We all agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a, a quick break and then come back and we will come to the, toward the end here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, all of you. You guys no, were I, just, I, love the way, I love that sentence. Yeah. From 1980, um, I was just kind of finding my way, painting landscapes, being really scared because I had gone to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, which was a conceptual art school. But then I found myself really wanting to paint landscapes, and I did. And I had, I had spent 
my most of my summer right after I graduated with a BFA from Nova Scotia in Europe, and I went to all the museums that I could find that I that had all this work that I had never seen before in real life, and I and I do think that real life trumps all the Googling you can possibly do ever forever. But um, so I spent all this time looking at all these paintings that I'd always wanted to see in person, and I was running through the. Um, I'll just show slides as I talk. I was running through the Moritz Swiss. I was sort of just ticking off museums, basically, at that point. And I was going through the portrait gallery, the way that it was set up then. And I was, I was thinking, ah, eh, portraits, this is so boring. And then I came to this painting. And I just stopped dead. I mean, literally, I was transfixed. And I'd never seen, the, I don't remember seeing this painting in art history class. I probably did and had fallen asleep at that point. And I just thought, well, this is the most, strange experience afterwards, because I stared at it for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I was really more interested in um, art made by so-called primitive cultures then, at that point. Long story, but I was kind of more interested in looking at African and oceanic art than major European art historical paintings and uh, works of art. But, and I did, because I wanted to see them anyway, but this was just something that was entirely unexpected. And then I went on to keep, um, then I went back to Nova Scotia, then I moved to New York, and I started painting after I got back. But I completely forgot about having seen this painting until like years later when I found myself working and something, not this one, actually a previous one, reminded me of that painting. And I thought, oh my God, everything that I've ever done in my paintings has been about that painting. Because when you look at the view of Delft, to me, there's this there's a kind of a sense of a proscenium. Bachelard would have described it as intimacy and immensity. That there's a kind of a, a sense of, of coalescing of, uh, for me, like light as emotion. I'm projecting, but I'm an artist. I can. Um, and so this, the way that the way that the verticals and the horizontal. I mean, this this painting to me weaves an actual place that's so specific, to me it feels like a person. It feels like the actual artist's soul in <coughs> place language. So, and, and then there's also this question for me about the interior and the exterior that exists in this painting that I'm, I'm looking in, I'm, I'm in the outside because I'm looking at a landscape, but there is a series of interiors and exteriors that keep happening and happening as you look at it that to me mirrors being a person in the world in, a, in the most profound and beautiful <coughs> and poetic way. So, and then it, ever since I've been, and so before that and ever since, I've been painting these paintings where I'm trying to connect earth and sky. I'm crossing water to get to land events, which are a kind of event. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to locate myself. And I think that the amazing thing about Vermeer is that he locates himself in both landscape, even though there's only a couple of examples, the Little Street being the other supremely beautiful painting, and in portraiture. And for me, I guess, you know, auto location or somehow finding out where I am is, is the big question. Art, I assume this is the case for most artists, unless they're very ideational, and I think that they're somehow um, carving out representations of ideas that they have. But this is like coming up to the present, so I'm just showing you like how big a thing this was for me with Vermeer because I think it continues to this very day. So I, own, I believe that I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. And for me, it's impossible that these were done by the same person because one is so awkward. The virginal girl is just so incredibly awkward and the red hat is so flowing. And I, keep, I kept wondering when I kept looking at it in your various slides if there might not have been um, just something that Vermeer was trying out with the girl with the red hat. That was just kind of a, not, not to say that Marie couldn't have done it, but I'm just wondering. Also, to your point about the, the state of empathy in terms of the um, girl with the pearl earring and the painting of Elizabeth, I can't help thinking, you know, when you were saying, I just want to say this for what it's worth. I kept thinking Vermeer loved both his daughters in the different way that they were. And Maria was much more beautiful, and Elizabeth wasn't. But Elizabeth has this crazy, open-hearted face. And maybe it's his painting of her 
because she, he, he had that kind of empathy for her and he loved her just the way she was. And if that's the case, then I think it's an extraordinary painting of empathy. And I think that all paintings really work via empathy via empathy and an empathetic response, and I think that the only way you can really look at a painting is with empathy. And the other thing about the, the painting of Elizabeth is that that bit of um, drapery behind her, I guess you'd say, from her garment that she's wearing, that is such a beautiful line. I mean, I think it's extraordinary. And I think it stands somewhat in contrast to her round, simple face. I don't know, it seems like a Vermeer move, like par excellence to me, so that's just my, my feeling about it. Um, and then the girl with the pearl earring and this, you know, I, to your point also about the dark background that usually is behind the, um, the, the double portraits where there's two figures, um, usually with a map or some kind of fabric or something like that. The difference between portrait and landscape is slim. This might sound odd, but I find myself particularly compelled by artists who do p paintings of people who will paint a singular image of a person with which I can have an intimate relationship. And for me, the way I try to paint landscapes is to try to allow a person to project into it so that they actually have an intimate experience with it, a, a very personal, uninterrupted experience that's, in my case, not mediated by other people in the, in the presence of the painting. I'm not interested in people looking at one of my paintings and seeing how big they are in relation to a tree or a boulder or a sky or water or whatever. But when, I've, when I find myself looking at a Vermeer, I also find myself captivated into, and I, I mean into, a kind of a space and a kind of a place that's both um, a kind of a, a person and also a kind of an, an entity that feels to me like an environment. It's like, and, and that of course mirrors the fact of painting. Great paintings are all complete environments in which you exist temporarily. You know, you make this exchange and, and you suddenly become that. That's, that's, your, that's the gift that painting is for us, that it allows that kind of extraordinary projection. So, and then um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the pictures that Benjamin showed. When I look at the, the woman in the red hat and the girl at the virginal, I just think, no way are these done by the same painter because for one thing, they're 10 years apart according to, do I have my dates right? Just, okay, and then what I looked up, the girl with the red hat was 1665, and the virginal was 1674-ish, 73-74. Okay, but I still think it's it just seems almost. A few a few comments from the from the crowd. Uh, one person during the during the break asked me pointed out that artists uh, art students always have to take art history classes and wondered how many art historians have to take painting classes and what kind of slippage might result. <laughs> and, and so th that's an issue. Uh, and uh, another comment uh, uh, about how, uh, well actually I'll, I'll, I'll let that person say it themselves in a little while. But so we are now going from, uh, from art historians, art curators, rec recovering art curators uh, to a panel of artists. Um, and in part, once again, asking to what extent what we've heard so far makes sense or doesn't make sense uh, from the point of view of a practicing artist. And we're going to do it with April Gornick over here first. Again, the biographies are all in your, in your pamphlets. Uh, and then it will be Chuck, and then it will be Jerry Davis, and then Vincent Desiderio. April. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to start off by saying that I was I didn't quite finish Benjamin's book, but I thought it was really terrific and very stimulating. Oh, is this on? Look, it's on my No. Is this, is it me? <laughs> is it me? It couldn't be. I'll just, okay. Okay. So, um, but I wanted to say that my, I guess, I guess Benjamin really won my heart when he referred to his daughter's apprenticeship and her eventual materializing as an artist being a kind of a art mitzvah <laughs> for her. <laughs> now, does that convince you to read the book? Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, I just wanted to start, I, you know, I wasn't going to show slides then, I was going to show slides, but I want to just run through a few slides because I have this very um, specific relationship with the view of Delft. Um, when I very first started painting paintings, and this is one